Thank you for joining us today at Discovery Park of America. I'm Katie Jarvis from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. I will be your host for this and other lessons with professors from the University of Tennessee at Martin. These lessons are for students in grades six through nine, but they will be of interest to anyone. Today we are talking with Dr. Teresa Collard, a communications professor at UT Martin. She will be teaching us how to organize and deliver an effective public speech. So Dr. Collard, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Katie, and thanks for that introduction. How many of you have heard the word glossophobia? Glossophobia is the fear of public speaking. It's believed that about 75% of our population have a common fear of public speaking. So when you're out there thinking, I'm afraid to give a speech, you're not alone. Even though it feels like you're alone in that moment, you really aren't alone. You will be joined by 75% of your fellows. So today I wanna to talk to you about how you can become an effective public speaker without so much fear. I'm not gonna say the fear will ever go away, but I believe healthy fear will propel you to do great things. But I will say, you have to let the fear go. You have to let it fly. And how can you do that? Three ideas. First and foremost, reject the idea that you have to be perfect. No one's perfect. Right. I'm not perfect. Right. Are you perfect, Katie? Absolutely not. No. But yet here we sit before you working our jobs and speaking to you publicly today. The second thing that I'll say is that you have to be uh, prepared for your speech. You have to prepare to give that speech. That means you, you write it or organize it and you think about practicing it. So you're prepared. So now you've, you've given up the idea that it has to be perfect. You prepare something and then you persist. What does that mean? Persist means that you do it anyway, even though you're afraid. And then you do it again. And then you do another speech until finally you understand that you're not going to die. I've been teaching public speaking for 35 years and thousands of speeches, thousands of speakers, not one of them's ever perished during the speech. You will live through it. No, I've had people who passed out, that was scary. Mm. Even some who cried, but, you, but they made their speeches successfully. You have to persist. And persistence will be one of the greatest lessons you'll learn if you just embrace it in your life. You can go through the fear and come out with this great product at the end. So you're gonna learn how to do that today by learning how to organize your speech and by also learning how you're going to present your speech because that's really sort of the scary part, isn't it? Standing up and speaking. So let's talk just a little bit about organization. The first and foremost thing is to come up with a topic, two rules, something you really, really love and love to talk about, love to engage in, or something you're interested in and you wanna learn more about it. Those are the two types of, of topics you should choose. I say go for the first one, but there are times you're going to be assigned a topic and you'll have to decide, I like that topic. I'm going to find out great things about it. Katie, what's a topic you love? Uh, well, of course, I love talking about Discovery Park of America. I live and breathe it, so it's really easy to talk about Discovery Park, but that's something that I love. And then I also love to hang out with friends and to eat food. I love food. What's your favorite food? Oh, Dr. Collard, I knew you were going to ask that. Uh, I love any, any chicken dish. Oh, yeah. I love chicken, too. Yeah. I love, I love chickens. I love them in real life. I love their eggs and, sadly, their meat. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So, that would be a great thing to talk about the food you love or Discovery Park. The truth is, Katie is always speaking about publicly about Discovery Park. And, and so, but she wasn't born a speaker. She, she took speech classes, she engaged in speech activities, and so she, she chose topics that she loved and she learned that she could talk about those things successfully. So that would be a great topic. Another thing that you wanna do, once you decide on your topic, and this is really, people talk about thesis statements or central ideas, but all it is, is what are the two or three things you wanna talk about, the points you want to make. So let's say that we're gonna talk about recycling. So what can we talk about? What's something I can talk about with recycling, Katie? Oh, why it's important. Yes, that's great. What's another thing? Um, the things that you can and can't recycle. Yes, and one more. Hmm, maybe um, some different products that are made from recycled materials. 
look at that. She has the idea and the backbone for her speech. It's the spine. And now she's just got to put the limbs on it and flesh it out and it'll become a speech. You know, there's a common reduce, reuse, recycle. Mm -hmm. Three topics right off the top of your head. What about, what if we were giving a speech about uh, Discovery Park of America? What would you say would be something you'd really want to say about Discovery Park? Just to someone who's never heard of it before. You've never heard of it. Where are we doing three? Do you need three? three? Let's do two topics. Let's do two. two. You, you can do two or three. Well, first of all, I would tell them what it is. And yes. then the second thing, I'd probably give the history behind how it came to be in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> right. As we are in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Right. So those would be my two, probably my two topics. So what exactly we are and our history. Right. So, okay. So now you've got that. There's one more thing, too, really. You want to find sources that will kind of speak the truth with you. So you don't have to stand up by yourself. I say when you speak a source, then suddenly you're not alone up there. Other people are saying what you say. So maybe, Katie, where would you find, where's a good place you could find a source? Um, so for my speech for Discovery Park? Yes. Um, I could probably just go talk to any of my coworkers yes. and get some uh, quotes from them. And because they were here before this beautiful building was built, I got to come when it was a finished product. So I could go back to um, some of my coworkers who were here when they were watching the building being built and get some sources, get some quotes from them. That's perfect. That's called testimony. She's going to go and she's going to get some test person that will testify about Discovery Park. She could look online. There's a lot of documents that are about the history of. There's a lot of places you could find sources. If you're giving a speech, maybe you love horses and you have you take horse lessons, talk to your, your trainer, talk to your teacher. So there's so many places that you can find sources. So and then finally, once you have all that, you want to make sure that you have an introduction and a conclusion. Something that, like I started out with glossophobia, and I'll have a little conclusion for you today in the lesson. So those are, that's the organization, and that is so important. Once you get that done, you have to actually, what I say is put it into action, right? So that's the scariest part. I Listen, when I give speeches, I get nervous. 33 years in, I speak publicly all the time. I've spoken to a thousand people at one time, a little bit more, and I get this nervous rash. Does it stop me from speaking? Heck no. I know it's going to happen. Maybe I wear a, a higher collar or maybe I just don't care because all I do is totally engage in my speech with my audience and it's never stopped me from getting applause or even a standing ovation so you have to just decide that you're not perfect it's not going to be perfect but you're going to do your very very best with your delivery so the very first thing i want to talk about is that you actually have to stand up right mostly we i'm seated today because this is a zoom lecture but but we'll stand up and the very first thing i'm going to ask you to do is learn about posture I want you to just a moment, think about yourself, Katie, as though you're a puppet. So I want you to put your hand in the middle of your head and pull yourself up straight. That's it. Not the chest out, chin out stuff. It's just stand up straight. There you go. And so you could carry this posture to a standing position. We won't today, but that's what you'll do. So that's good posture. You want to, with that good posture, plant your feet. You're like a tree. You're not able to walk around, but you can move in the wind but you cannot just be like stomping around and clomping around because what's gonna happen is that's going to magnify all your nervousness. Interesting thing, almost all your nervousness comes out of you in, that, in, in, in your legs. You release it in that lower body. So if Katie's up giving a speech, she's thinking about having to use her hand and her face and all of that, but, so she lets all those cues out and she's wandering around. Here's a trick. Put ink pens or pencils on the top of your shoes when you stand up to present. Make your legs shoulder width apart or some comfortable stance. If your pins are falling off, you're moving too much. Mm. Simple, yeah? Yeah. Second thing, you have to have gestures. So gestures are the use of your hands. It's smiling. It's the face. I'm going to talk about eyes individually, but we gesture with our eyes. I wish I could raise my eyebrow. Can you raise your eyebrow? Yeah. So you raise both. Can you I do just can. one? I can't try. do just one. I wish I could. But yeah, that, hey, that's pretty good. So, you know, we can say a lot with our eyes and our eyebrows and our face, but the strike zone for gestures are from your chin 
to your belly button. So when you're standing up, you're going to use gestures. You're gonna you're gonna use your hands. So many people say don't use your hands, but then that's you look like a robot. Huh? That's what you've always said. No, you look like a robot. From your class, though. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> but, but you look robotic, and it makes you more nervous. One of the ways that we can dispel nervous energy is to move. So we're not moving our feet, we'll move our hands. We'll lean into our audience. When you lean towards your audience, you're saying, I like you, I, I want to help you, I want you to learn something, so you lean in. So that's, that's stance, so you wanna stand still, then you wanna use your gestures, okay? The next thing, very, very important, is eye contact. You will make eye contact with your audience. Now, so many people say, look over their heads, Look over their heads. Look, don't look right at them. That's craziness. We learn to speak to understand language non-verbally first. So when you're when you were a baby and your mother got nervous, you might have cried because you would have recognized the nonverbal cues in her voice. So we we know eye contact. It's one of our very first skills we learn. So if you're looking above someone's head, they're gonna know that. So look them in the eye. Look them in the eye. I'll give you a secret. Your audience wants you to succeed. They, they're cheering you on. They, they are going to be upset if you, if you get nervous. So trust them, trust them. They will look you back in the eye and they'll be so pleased that you're giving the speech. So eye contact is so important. You want to look around though. Like if I just stared at Katie, there'd come a point where she would get really nervous and she'd <laughs> laugh or turn red or something. You can't do that, you'll kill them. You'll kill your little audience member who's supporting you. You need to look around, share the wealth, look left and right, but not like you're like, like that. Just look around your room. When you change ideas, go to a different side. Look at another side and look in the middle. So look around, okay? The last element of the delivery is the most important. It's your voice. I don't think you probably understand just how poor, important your voice is for people knowing who you are, what you think, what matters to you. And if you steal that voice, if you do not speak, and if you do not give your public speeches, then we're not going to know who you are. We're not going to know what matters to you. It's such a gift mm -hmm. to you to share and for us to receive that message. So you want to use your voice. Here are some tricks. Number one, breathe. I'm gonna teach you to breathe right now, Katie, you can help, okay? okay so ready. if you've ever had that quivery voice or maybe you feel a lot of nervous, nervous energy, you probably are not breathing correctly. And so I'm gonna teach you what's called rectangular breathing. And what's gonna happen is that you're gonna, you're gonna hold your breath at the top, you're gonna to breathe in and hold it, and it's gonna oxygenate your blood and send oxygen right to your brain. It's gonna calm you down. You can use this technique when you're taking tests and things like that. And what's going to happen is it when you get oxygenated, you'll probably score as, as many as two or three extra points on a test because you're oxygenated. So here we go. Let's try it. But it's also going to calm you down. It's going to get you settled and, and ready. So I'm going to we're going to inhale. You're going to hold for three, exhale for three, and you're going to hold. Now on that bottom hold, you're probably going to continue to exhale, and that's good because we exhale. Exhalation is to get toxins out of our body, right? So you're letting some of that nervous energy out with that exhalation. So okay, here we go, we're gonna do it three times. Okay. Inhale, through your nose, if you, sorry, we'll okay. do it again, you can release. <laughs> if, you inhale, if you inhale through your, through your mouth, you trigger adrenaline, it'll make you more nervous. Oh. So inhale through your, through your nose, okay? Exhale here we go. Exhale through your nose or mouth, either one, but when you inhale, don't, because think about it, when you get surprised, you go, <gasps> Yep. It's that it's it'll it causes adrenaline rush. So okay. here we go. Okay. All right. Inhale. Hold. Exhale. Hold. Inhale. Hold. Exhale. Hold. One more time. Inhale. Hold. Exhale. Hold. Now, shake it off just a little. You can do that from your seat before you give a speech, and you really will feel more centered. Another thing you can do just before you go out, before you leave like a private space, is to do this. Ha! 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 ha. It, it takes energy, and it clears your voice, and it makes you project volume. That's the next thing. So now we've got a cleansed kind of 
throat and, and we're ready. We've got to have projection. I've got to be able to hear you. Mm -hmm. If you're speaking really quiet, no one's going to want to listen to that. We're lazy. Americans are terribly lazy listeners. They don't want to listen to you if you're too quiet, if they can't understand you. So just project. We project from our diaphragm. Diaphragm is like a trampoline or a balloon. Let's say a balloon. So when you inhale, let's inhale and put your hand on your stomach. You're going to feel it come out. Inhale through your nose. You feel your chest kind of expand, your stomach come out. Exhale, you feel it deflate. It's like, it's an upside down balloon. It inhales, you, when you inhale, it inflates. When you exhale, it deflates. It's, and it's right here on your stomach. So you want to breathe and project from that diaphragm instead of from your throat. If you're a singer, try not to sing from your throat. Try to sing from here. The difference would be like, hello, hello. You feel it there as a, hello, hello, like that, okay? So. That would be, that would be uh, how you project well, good volume. We want to be able to hear you. What you say matters. I said that already, right? So let's, let's hear it. And then finally, you want to think a little bit about your voice and diction and your rate. So rate is how quickly you speak. We can process up to 500 words a minute just listening. Wow. But our, we only speak about 125 to 150 words a minute typically. So we have this speech thought differential. I call it lag time. Mm -hmm. So you might have thought, man, I'm hungry. Oh, look at that hair, it's sticking out like that. You might, have, you might have gone away from me for a second, but we come back in. So as a speaker, you wanna speak at a nice clip, but not too fast that it's uncomfortable and not too slow that it's boring, right? Mm -hmm. So find that comfortable pace. Very important thing to note though, when you speed up, if you've been going slower, it's gonna call attention, or when you slow down, if you've been faster. So. Something very important. Feel me slow down, you, you check up because I say it's important and I make it more significant. Mm -hmm. Okay, and last but not least, voice and diction. And in the South or wherever you're listening from, you probably have an accent. And I will say that accents are great as long as we can understand what you're saying. Right. So think about, yeah, think about your accent. So what's a word we might say in the South? We might say, I'm gonna do that, right? Mm -hmm. But we should say, I'm going to do that. We can do that. It's just instead of gonna, we're going to. Can you think of a, a little accent maybe you have, Katie? Oh, I know I say y'all a lot. Um, I love y'all. Let's not get rid of that, <laughs> okay, okay? okay? I like I like that plural, yeah. plural pronoun we try to use oh, in the South. I've, so I've got one, I've got one. I'm fixing to go to the store. Yes, I'm fixing to, instead of I'm going to go to the store, right? So just think about that. You don't have to have like the standard accent. You just need to be able to be understood. So if you have an accent, think about making sure people understand what you're saying. One time someone said to me, Teresa, I'm going to carry you somewhere. And I said, well, it's going to be quite a load, but let's go. <laughs> I didn't, in that context, that's not what I think of carrying, but they meant get in the car and drive over, right? Oh, yeah. I had never heard that when I moved here. I'm from the South, but I'd never heard that until I moved to West Tennessee. Yeah. So think about your voice and diction. All of that, if you practice and if you stand up and you think about your speeches, you are going to be able to be an effective speaker. I want to I wanna give you just a few more things. The very first thing is you must practice, practice, practice. Mm -hmm. If you do not practice, you will not be successful. And if you do not quiet the negative inner voice that says you are not going to do well, you will most likely not do well. You have what's called a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm not gonna do well. So you don't try to do well and you don't do well. But if you say to that inner voice, hey, Chip, get off my shoulder. I'm gonna to listen to the good angel today and I'm going to really believe in myself and I'm going to practice and I'm gonna time my speech, then you're gonna be successful. Another thing is to picture yourself confidently succeeding. Athletes do this all the time. It's called visualization. They literally see themselves making the perfect play, the perfect pitch, the perfect catch, whatever it would be. You need to see yourself begin your speech proceed through it and end it confidently, happily. It might not be perfect, I don't care about perfect, but it will help you do better because you see yourself. So at night, before you give a speech, go through it in your head. You don't have to know the words, I just want you seeing yourself succeeding, feeling the audience supporting you in that energy. It's good, it's good, the energy is good. Mm -hmm. Next, believe in yourself. I can't say it enough. 
Be confident and believe in yourself. Say to yourself, I got this, I can do it. It might not be perfect, that's okay. Just believe in yourself. And then embrace the idea that what you say absolutely matters and that it's important that you share it with others. Sometimes you're like, nobody wants to hear what I have to say. Of course we do. Of course we do. The best thing about relationships is when we come to understand who another person is and what he or she thinks. So share that. Share that privately, but share it publicly. Get people to listen to your speech. You know, when I was in college, I paid people in pizza, Katie. I would say on Sunday night, we didn't have meal plan on Sunday night. So I'd say, I'm going to order a pizza. You got to listen to my speech three times. I'll pay I for it. it. My friends did it. And my friends were cruel. So anytime I got through my friends, I was a well-prepared speaker when it came to They're the best critics. Yeah, they are. They are. And then, so you, you know that it matters. And finally, allow your ideas to be heard. Give them voice. Give them wings. Send them soaring into the world. You'll be better for it. The world will be richer for it. So thank you for being here today. I hope something I said today helps you be a better speaker. Well, hey. Dr. Dr. Collard, that was wonderful. And, you know, being a former student of you at, um, at the University of Tennessee at Martin, I learned a lot from you. And one of my favorite things that has stuck with me as I've gone into my professional career is when I do give public speeches for Discovery Park, um, you, I remember you telling me that Katie, nobody knows your story except you. So if you don't, if you don't get the idea that you really practiced across, nobody's going to know except for exactly. You. So um, I really have taken that to heart and that's how I deliver speeches now. And I wanted to share one other thing because it's so funny in the fourth grade, we had to do um, a book report. And so I had to get up in front of everybody. I was a, a WNBA, you know, superstar. <laughs> that's who I read a book. I can't remember the lady's that's name, cool. but um, I remember I got up front and I had my Jersey on and I had my basketball and the book and I had my note cards. And I just remember just freezing and just like, I started to cry and I was so nervous. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but now looking forward, I mean, here I am in a, in a public speaking job. And so I just have, you know, we just grow and middle schoolers, it's a little nervous and even into high school and even college, I was nervous in your public speaking class. And those were among all my friends. And exactly. So, um, it was just, you know, public speaking is nerve wracking, but of course you can overcome it. Like you said, is, is if you believe in yourself and that you know that you can succeed and do it. So I just wanted to thank you personally and, and thank you for um, sharing with our listeners and our viewers today. Before we get off, you want to do something with me? Yeah, sure. And I'll ask everybody out there to do it as well. Yeah. So repeat after me, Dr. Collard. Dr. Collard. I promise. I promise. To do my best. To do my best. To be my best. To be my best. To expect only the best from others. To expect only the best from others. And to accept only the best for myself. And to accept only the best for myself. And you know, Katie, why I have people say that is because if you do your best, that means you're trying as hard as you can. Mm -hmm. If you're being your best, it means you're not just thinking about yourself, but you're thinking about being your best with other people. If you expect only the best from others, what else can happen? They're going to, they're going to give you that energy back. And mm -hmm. finally, if you accept only the best for yourself, it means that you're going to work hard to succeed and to excel, be it at public speaking or French or whatever it is that you love. So please practice public speaking. You'll be all the richer for it. Awesome. Thank you again so much, Dr. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today, all of our followers and listeners. We look forward to continuing our mission here at Discovery Park of inspiring children and adults to see beyond. For more educational resources, visit our website at discoveryparkofamerica.com slash education. We'll see you next time.